This is CBC Here and Now. It's great for us with regards to being busy, but uh, I'm concerned about why the people are, are, are having to come back home. They're coming back because they're on hard times out west. Business is booming, but this mover worries about the number of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians coming home during COVID. Five ferry routes in the province have returned to regular service today. An update on the captain's strike and the damage done to the towns involved. Seasonal temperatures on tap for the next little bit, but we are going to see a little bit of a warm up as we see a change back to southwesterly flow. However, that is going to bring the potential for some showers. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Peter Cowan. Some moving companies on the Avalon are noticing an unusual trend. More people from out of province wanting to move home. Yes, and what's the cause of that? Is it because of economic uncertainty elsewhere, the low presence of COVID in our province, or is it baby boomers looking to return for retirement? The why is up for debate, but as Terry Roberts reports, experts don't see this as a solution to our population problem. It's a Friday afternoon at LaDrew's Moving in Mount Pearl some rare downtime following a really busy summer. Over the years, these guys have helped facilitate a steady flow of people away from this province, but not this year. Typically, my brother and I are used to dealing with a mass exodus out of Newfoundland this time of year, but this, uh, this year has been a totally different. In the past, when trucks like these traveled to mainland Canada, they usually left with a full load and came back empty. But these are unprecedented times. Normally, I would think that some rough numbers are probably 60% of our business is, is leaving Newfoundland for long distance moves and, and 40 is coming in. But this year, for sure, it's 70, 30 or, or even 75, 25, you know, with regards to coming back to Newfoundland. A lot of people moving back to the island. It's the same story with Five Star Moving in Kellegrews. Actually, the amount of people moving back is unprecedented compared to what it has been over, say, the past five, six, seven years. As soon as the truck gets back from Ontario and gets unloaded, two or three days later, it's headed right back to Ontario again to bring another load back. There's a backlog of inbound moves well into the fall. Right now, it's going to be very difficult for us to get anybody back onto the island now until sometime in mid-October to the early part of November right now, you know. All the trucks that I have are full right now, you know. This is a new twist to an age-old story. For generations, our citizens have drifted westward in search of better opportunity. But with the entire country facing economic hardship and coronavirus fears, it's hard to ignore what these relocation specialists are saying. It's great for us with regards to being busy, but uh, I'm concerned about why the people are having to come back home. You know, I, I don't feel that a lot of them are, are coming back home because they've got gainful employment here. You know, they're coming back because they're on hard times out west with their, with their jobs, certainly in the oil patch and everything else related to that. In places like Calgary, jobs in the oil industry are drying up. And that's why this photo, a full family picture in Glovertown, is now possible. After two profitable decades in Calgary, Bill Perry lost his job as a geophysicist. So these homesick Newfoundlanders returned to their roots. We've been planning for years to come back to Newfoundland. You just never had the opportunity. With COVID and when my company decided, you know, they were moving out, that was it. That was the final. It cemented our decision. It cemented our decision to move. For us just to be here, I'm super excited. We have way more security now coming back than when we left. We left with empty bank accounts and education. And we're coming back in a lot better financial situation and a lot of skill set. And we're hoping to invest that in the community. But experts caution against any notion of a population surge. According to Statistics Canada, we lost 4,500 people from this province last year alone through interprovincial migration. The worst imbalance in more than a decade. Is there a population boom underway in Newfoundland? I don't think so. What the moving companies do not see, says Greenwood, are the large number of young people getting in their cars or on a plane and heading west. Many of them do not need the help of a moving company. No, I would call it in the short term a COVID blip. And I think it's a demographic baby boomer phenomenon for the most part uh, until we see the numbers in the census. 
we won't know for sure. But this veteran mover has a different thought. I can promise you the numbers are going to show that there's been an increase in the population in the last three months. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, more Newfoundlanders and Labradorians may be moving home, but they could struggle to find work, especially if they're in the trades. According to Trades NL, 85% of tradespeople in Newfoundland and Labrador are out of a job. The union says that's about 1,500 workers. Trades NL represents more than a dozen building and construction unions in the province. It's calling on the federal and provincial governments to do more to get people back to work. Those are high numbers, yeah, and uh, you know the challenge we're facing here, of course, is, is people don't have a lot of optimism. I mean, we're not seeing any answers from the provincial go or federal government, sorry, on the oil and gas, uh, which is very frustrating. Um, and from our perspective, there's a role for the provincial government to play here as well, because there's a lot of provincial work ongoing. We've been advocating for a hiring policy similar to Muskrat Falls, where Newfoundlanders and Labradorans get hired first, and we're not making any headway whatsoever. So, you know, we're frustrated. People are starting to lose a bit of hope that there's any opportunity for the future. Well, we can hear more of my conversation with Darren King there from Trades NL. He has a lot more to say on that topic, and you'll hear it later in the show. Meanwhile, a new deal could put an end to the ferry captain's strike. Normal schedules resumed today after an announcement late last night that there was a tentative agreement. Here now is Garrett Berry he has been following this story. He's with us live tonight from Gander. Garrett, what are you hearing from people? It's certainly a return to normal, as you mentioned, Peter, and uh, those ferry routes, the five in question, have been disrupted for 20 days. So a lot of frustration has been built up over the past three or so weeks that some relief coming now is, is, is great news for those people. Uh, of course, the details of the tentative agreement have not been released yet, but it hasn't come, it couldn't have come any sooner for mayors in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. I, I spoke to one today from the mayor of Ramia. Here's a little bit of that conversation. If you went for an appointment, and a lot of people have appointments uh, uh, on, well, normally corner rope for uh, regular doctor's appointments or dental or or eye appointments, whatever, and you could leave, but there was no guarantee you were going to get back home that evening. And you may have indeed been in the hospital for surgery and the like. So uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was very stressful, no doubt about that. Ramia was reduced to one crossing most days, which led to long lineups and a lot of frustration. With this tentative agreement in place, the island now has three crossings most days. Mayor Clyde Dominey says that's a sigh of relief. It ends a lot of uncertainty for his residents. The strike brought rural communities together under one banner to advocate for a solution, and one mayor isn't quite done yet. The mayor of Fogo Island says he's now going to push for contractual changes to make sure a situation like this can't ever happen again. We cannot allow this to occur. I mean, it has to be similar to the to the RNC of the problem, Santa or the prison guards, something of that nature. I mean, they've got a, a binding arbitration agreement whereby if there's a disagreement and they can't reach a, reach or settle the dispute that's occurred, there, there's a binding arbitration. He says this strike has hit Fogo Island hard. That community was also left with just one crossing a day in the beginning of this dispute. And it wasn't very convenient during the summer of staycations. A number of tourists, he said, decided to just cancel their trip altogether. It was very evident that people were trying to make the best of what was left of the tourism season. And that was, as I mentioned earlier again, that's, that was lost to us, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's devastating. Maybe some, some of their businesses will carry on and pick up the pieces in the next season. But there's others, I'm sure, will find it much more difficult. Now the unions that the union rather that represents ferry captains decided not to speak to the media today so we don't know exactly what's in this agreement and we don't know exactly why an agreement was reached however at, at this point the agreement is only tentative so it does still have to go to a vote to the captains themselves before this strike officially comes to an end. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Gander. Some rotational workers say they're left out of the new ability for shorter isolation. Crews working on ships in the Great Lakes are the latest group to be told they're going to have to isolate for the full 14 days, even if they test negative for COVID-19. Lydia Francis is dealing with that issue. Her husband works on a freighter. I reached her in Isle of Mort to find out why he's being treated differently. 
not looking forward to 14 days of isolation. Anything is better. So we would have took the seven days and uh, we called 811. They gave me a number. I called that number. Uh, they called my husband back Tuesday morning, I guess, asked him where he worked to. So he's a Laker. Um, and they said, well, we'll need more information on the Lakers. So that was Tuesday morning at 1030 uh, of last Tuesday, the 8th of September, I think that date is. And they actually called that yesterday afternoon. No one called us before then. Um, no one even returned our calls. You mentioned Lakers there. Exactly what does your husband do? My husband carries grain, uh, different types of cargo from Canadian. He, he gets on his boat in Toronto and off in Toronto. They're not allowed off in the States anyway, not even for a minute. They carry grain, so they carry it to different ports in Canada and sometimes the States. Not always the States, though. Sometimes they might go for months and not even go to the States. Uh, they carry, uh, he, he's in the background telling me he carries iron ore. <laughs> How hard is that? It's very hard. It's mentally hard. It's physically hard. Um, a little bit better now that he can jump on his quad and go for a ride, but still you got, my husband's very cautious. So if you comes near him and he's just getting home, he will tell you himself that I just got home, so you need to stay six feet. So he's very cautious in that. Um, so, so it's hard. You're not being able to just do what you're used to doing. So what did they tell you about why he doesn't qualify for that shorter isolation? because they actually, their boat sometimes goes to the state, so they're not qualified. Even though they are not allowed ashore, they're not allowed off the boats. Uh, there's a letter from my husband's company personally saying that if they get off in the states, they have to go home and quarantine without pay. So, I don't understand. I don't think it's fair. I'm not dishing any of the rotational workers, but um, as per se, like a rotational worker that works in Ontario might have had an apartment. So every day they can go get their essentials that they need. They can just go for driving Tim's if they want to. So they can come home and get tested in five days and released in seven if negative. But my husband, who's stuck on a boat for 30 days, not allowed ashore, can't get his essentials, got to get on a plane and come home and still stay another two weeks. I don't see the fairness. I really don't see the fairness in that. I think all rotational workers should be treated the same. So workers on those ships have been told they're essential workers and the federal government doesn't require them to quarantine. But that's not what the provincial government is saying. Here's how the Minister of Health responded when we raised the concern from these workers. If apparently, and I learned this very recently, a um, ship leaves Canadian waters and goes into international waters, they fall under federal jurisdiction. Uh, and we have no say. So the feds will determine what uh, those requirements are. Well, the Liberal government is facing tough questions about its efforts to help the province's oil industry. Both opposition parties want the government to step in. Here and now's Mark Quinn reports. Concerns about oil and gas launched question period today with the Liberals fielding questions about the industry and what the province is doing to support it. We have been working with Ottawa for the last six months, working with industry, working to develop a plan, working to ensure that we have a vibrant industry offshore. But progressive conservative MHAs say they're hearing from people who can't wait much longer. Well, three people from the West Coast, Northern Peninsula, Port of Basque, all three of them going to work on the Terra Nova in Conception Bay and wondering if this was their last trip. Now that's what people are talking about and that's what we should be talking about. Let's get on with this. Wakem believes it's time for the Liberals to consider a different strategy. They keep talking about the fact that they've been beating for five months. So I'd like to understand, they've also talked about their friendly relationship with Ottawa. Maybe it's time to not be a friend of Ottawa or a friendly relationship and stand up for Newfoundland and Labrador and start demanding some fair treatment. The NDP says the industry does need help now, but it doesn't believe oil and gas has a bright future. Absolutely, we cannot turn our back on the oil industry. We have enormous amount of investment in the industry. We have a, a tremendous number of individuals who are involved in working in the offshore oil industry and who are involved in, in the secondary and tertiary industries associated with that. What we do need to do is prudently look at how volatile that industry is. We cannot turn our backs on the royalties associated with it. But somewhere along the way, we do need to recognize the very real probability that this industry is fading away. Offshore oil workers and their supporters are expected to rally at the Confederation building tomorrow. 
Union leaders who organized the event say they'll be demanding all levels of government help the industry and protect jobs. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, police in St. Anthony are investigating two break-ins there, one at the Boys and Girls Club. According to the RCMP, thieves stole a large amount of money from the nonprofit organization. The other break-in was at St. Anthony's Green Depot. Police released these photos from the surveillance footage today. They haven't linked the break-ins, but say there's a possibility the two are connected. The break-ins happened between September 4th and the 8th. Police are asking anyone with information to get in touch. Certainly this year has been a, a tough year for people and with regards to mental health. A fundraiser for women's mental health services is going virtual this year. We'll find out how the Run for Women will boost programming at Stella Circle. Do you happen to notice those hazy skies today? Well, I'll tell you what those are all about. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. A nice evening in St. John's right now, but it looks like it's clouded over a bit. It has. We did see some high cloud move in earlier this afternoon. We talked about the fact that we would see uh, that happen, certainly in the east, and we can thank uh, Hurricane Paulette for that. Let's take a look at what the satellite is showing us right now, and you can see that high cloud mainly affecting eastern areas of the province. And then we've got that area of low pressure that has moved offshore now uh, to the north, and that's still bringing the potential for some showers, though, through Labrador. There's uh, Hurricane Paulette. It is going to pass very well south of Newfoundland, but we will uh, more than likely see some higher waves as we head through the day tomorrow and certainly into and certainly into Thursday as well. The other thing you may have noticed if you've been looking outside to your southern sky is a little bit of a haze in the atmosphere and that's actually the smoke from the wildfires that are happening in the western portion of North America and the states and into Canada as well. And all of that smoke because of the weather pattern has moved our way. So it will be actually probably a pretty cool night to go out and look at the sunset because it'll the smoke will actually cause a reddish or an orange and yellow tint to the sky. So something, uh, something that will be pretty cool as we head through the night tonight. Temperatures across the board though much less humid than what we saw yesterday. 15 degrees in St. John, 16 in Terranova. We've got similar temperatures pretty much across the board with those single digit temperatures in through uh, Labrador. Makovic actually saw a little bit of wet snow this morning as your temperatures were quite cool. And as we head through the night tonight, because they, we are sitting under a ridge of high pressure, there is a frost advisory in place. So uh, anywhere in those low lying areas, you could see temperatures anywhere from minus two to plus two. And that means that uh, we could see some frost overnight and under clear skies. And then up through Labrador, you're pretty much just looking at some scattered showers possible through central and lab west. Otherwise, quiet night for you as well. Those winds will ease as we head through the overnight tonight. Temperatures, though, dipping. Like I said, one degree for Grand Falls, Windsor, five in Gander, eight in St. John's. Winds will ease pretty much from west to east. And then you're looking at temperatures in those single digits up through Labrador as well. Maine going down to a low near five degrees overnight tonight. Now, tomorrow, that ridge of high pressure is still intact for us. Uh, we could even see some more smoke in the higher atmosphere again for southwestern portions of the island as well as the Avalon at times tomorrow. Uh, but you'll note that wind shift, so it'll probably push that smoke further offshore. Uh, however, we will start to see some clouds move in for Labrador, bringing the potential for some showers, certainly along the west coast as we head into the afternoon for the island and then continue to spread across uh, the big land as we head into the evening hours with uh, temperatures pretty much similar to what we're seeing today. A degree or two warmer in some cases, 14 to 17 degrees, but the winds won't be as nearly as brisk as they are today. Uh, northerly winds in the east, so you're looking at 20 to 30 kilometers per hour, and they're still going to be southwesterly for you in, uh, in the west, with winds gusting upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour. Up through Labrador, 
Temperatures rebounding just a little bit, so into the teens for most of you. Single digit temperature still expected for Lab City, but you'll note your winds will, will ease through the day down to about 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Now, as we head into Thursday, things are gonna get a little bit more unsettled, although we do get back into that southerly flow, which means the temperatures are going to climb right along with that. Uh, but it does look like it'll be a, a wet Thursday, certainly into Friday morning as you head further uh, east across the island. And that will generally continue as we head into the afternoon hours as well. But there are those temp that bump in temperature. So back to the 20 degree uh, range, 20 in St. John's with some sunshine. And then we'll see that rain move in late day. Happy Valley Goose Bay. 12 degrees, but I do have that snow icon, at least a wet snow potential uh, in for Lab City as your temperature only reaches a high near three degrees. It rebounds a little bit on, uh, on Friday, which will more than likely see some showers, but it is a generally gray day across the island. You'll see you can hang on to some of those warmer temperatures in the east, and again, because of those winds, and then you get that shift to a more northerly component wind in the west. So temperatures will be dipping into those teens again. Eventually, as we head into Saturday, we will see that wind shift. So temperatures will dip back down, uh, barely reaching the double digits for both Saturday and Sunday and overnight lows as well, dipping back down into those single digits. For central Newfoundland, you're looking at a similar uh, forecast. Look at uh, the overnight low on Sunday, flirting with the zero degree mark. And then for Western Newfoundland, same thing. Some sunshine, though, will return uh, late day Saturday into Sunday when temperatures hanging around in the teens. But overnight lows, again, dipping pretty cool into those single digits. For Eastern Labrador, sunshine for most of the weekend at this point. And same thing for Western Labrador, although your temperatures will be just a little bit cooler than, um, than that, around 6 to 8 degrees. So I wanted to share this beautiful shot. Look at this, catching the sunset in Churchill Falls. Thank you so much uh, to Dawn for sharing that photo with us. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Gorgeous. Thanks, Ashley. Well, like so many fundraising events, the fifth annual Run for Women is going virtual this year. The run usually happens at Kitty Vitty Lake, but now participants can complete the challenge at any location. The money raised supports women's mental health programs at Stella Circle. Today, we met up with organizers and one of the running groups taking part in the event. So they're doing a warm up uh, right now um, and they've been every Tuesday uh, meeting uh, to do a warm up and to walk or run and build their skills and their plan is to uh, participate uh, next week. Um, they're doing a group run uh, as part of our Shoppers Love You Run for Women. It's an opportunity for uh, men, women, families to get together and do a walk or run, uh, 5 or 10K, um, and proceeds for the event go to support women's mental health initiatives at Stella Circle. There's three days left to register. The run is going to be held, or the walk, from the 17th to the 27th of September. And you can register at runforwomen.ca. You can pick St. John's, which will basically cover the whole province for the run. And there's an opportunity for people to have fun, participate, get together in small groups, and celebrate um, all the work that we do in support of mental health across the province. So we have uh, two programs which are uh, women provide women-focused services, and they would be the Just Us Women's Center, which provides supports and services to women uh, who have uh, justice-involved histories. And we also have Naomi Center, which is our shelter for homeless young women uh, between the ages of 16 and 30. Uh, so proceeds from this go to support initiatives that uh, take place through these programs um, and there are a wide range of services to support women's mental health um, and it, it can include things such as uh, groups uh, that we might offer around grief and loss, um, it can be empowerment uh, groups, uh, it can be specialized groups and services that run from our shelter for homeless women. COVID's been tough on everybody, and I think everybody needs to draw that connection between mental health and physical health. And we know across, uh, as pharmacists across Canada, that the closer your mental health is connected to your physical health, and if you're strong mentally, you'll be strong physically. So we're trying to encourage people to exercise more, walk more, get out in small groups more, have fun together more, and, and draw that direct connection between the two. Certainly this year has been a, a tough year for people and with regards to mental health, and we know that, you know, one of the things that's come as a result of it too certainly is people feeling more isolated in community and uh, certainly earlier in the year people were 
um, at home a lot more. Um, I think that this run has also given people an opportunity to see what it's like to kind of experience the get outdoors um, in a way that's safe and get involved in something. Um, but we know that it's been isolating for people and so part of what we've worked on this year as well is helping people get connected whether that's virtually uh, through being able to access things like cell phones that they may not have had before and really supporting uh, women to have the opportunity to connect with others and to help enhance and build good mental health. So typically this was a run by Kitty Vitty, so we do a 5K or 10K run around Kitty Vitty. This year with COVID, it's virtual, so it's an opportunity right across the province for everybody to get involved. So whether you're from Twillingate, where I'm from, or from Port of Basque, everybody can join in. So there's an opportunity for everybody in the province to join in and walk, run, have fun with your, your friends, your colleagues, right across the whole province. So when you register, it's $40, and all those funds go to Stella's Circle this year. So your entire $40 is a donation to Stella's. Everybody gets a t-shirt, they get a lovely bracelet, and they get a swag bag full of lots of goodies, and that bag is worth a value of over $100. How many people typically take part in the run? So we, our goal is for over a thousand. Uh, we are over a thousand, but not quite to where we're, uh, where we want to be. So we're, we're hoping over the next three days um, that we'll get a, a full roster. And uh, you know, it's an opportunity for people to give back. Um, all the proceeds uh, from the bag go to support Stella Circle initiatives locally. Our numbers are getting a little better, but we're still pushing around 80% unemployed. There are thousands of tradespeople unemployed in this province. Find out what the union wants government to do. People are starting to lose a bit of hope that there's any opportunity for the future. Welcome back to Here and Now. COVID has curbed spending on big construction projects in this province. A lot of unionized trades workers are sitting at home, not working. Trades NL says 15,000 of their members are unemployed, and they think governments could be doing more to get them back to work. Darren King is the head of the union group. Give me an idea, how many of your members are unemployed right now? Our most recent numbers, Peter, show about around 80 to 85 percent unemployed. Uh, we're in the field now collecting the data from our unions. Um, we were at about 95 percent two months ago. Uh, we picked up some local work in Valais, in the expansion project, and also some local uh, provincial work on some construction here. So our numbers are getting a little better, but we're still pushing around 80 percent unemployed. That's a lot. Those are high numbers, yeah, and uh, you know the challenge we're facing here, of course, is, is people don't have a lot of optimism. I mean, we're not seeing any answers from the provincial go or federal government, sorry, on the oil and gas, uh, which is very frustrating. Um, and from our perspective, there's a role for the provincial government to play here as well, because there's a lot of provincial work ongoing. We've been advocating for uh, hiring policy similar to Muskrat Falls, where Newfoundlanders and Labradorans get hired first, and we're not making any headway whatsoever. So, you know, we're frustrated. People are starting to lose a bit of hope that there's any opportunity for the future. How much of this is just a right-sizing of the industry? For the longest time, we had Muskrat Falls, we had Long Harbor, we had Hebron, all billion-dollar projects that aren't really going to come back again. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There, there's going to be an adjustment period. I mean, the chances of us ever going back to the days when we had uh, Valet, Hebron, and Muskrat simultaneously, we, I mean, we were employing 15, 16, I think 16 and a half thousand people at one point at the same time. So yeah, I think you're right. There's going to be an adjustment period as, as some people leave the trades. Uh, they're, you know, It'll, it'll right size itself, but nonetheless, we do have a lot of young tradesmen and women who are still, you know, in their late 20s and early 30s, young families, and really want to make a career here. And, and we've developed a really strong workforce and a really strong, strong reputation. And if we don't see action from the province and the Fed soon, uh, there's a real risk that uh, we're going to lose that workforce to other parts of the country or the world. The province has made it clear it doesn't have the money to invest in West White Rose. What exactly can it do then to try and put people back to work? We're focused on the West White Rose project, but if you park that for a moment, there are significant other opportunities that the province has a direct role in. And I'll just give you one example. <clears throat> they just announced a new mental health facility. The province could adopt an NL First policy, like we have in Muskrat, where the hiring priority is Newfoundlanders, Labradorians first. The province hasn't done that. 
what we've seen uh, through their reputation on other projects in the last 24 months is that there are a lot of outside workers, workers from other provinces coming in while our own workers are unemployed. So if the province moved and made that step, which is cost neutral, just adopt the policy, a hiring policy, it would provide some hope and optimism that, that there is a future here for skilled trades workers. That's the first. The second point is the province can have a significant say in how the refit for the Terra Nova proceeds with Suncor and whether that goes out of country like it was planned to or whether the part of the work stays here and goes into Bull Arm. Uh, likewise with the Beta Nord project and likewise with the with the uh, the Sea Rose is, is up in a couple of years. Like all of those projects, the province will have a direct say in, to to the owner in how the work, the modal development proceeds and, and how the work moves. So that's not necessarily a monetary issue. It's about the province and the Premier making a decision to say, we're going to support the Newfoundland and Labrador workers first and we're making this decision and the companies have to abide by it. So, you know, I understand the focus is on the federal government now, but from our perspective, uh, we hope people shift their focus back a little because the province can't just let themselves off the hook here. They have a role to play in creating jobs for skilled trades workers. Well, thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome. Appreciate it. The progressive conservatives in New Brunswick solidified their power last night in what was the first provincial election since the pandemic began. After two years in office, Premier Blaine Higgs led his party from a minority to a majority position. He says that will provide more certainty for his government and for all New Brunswickers. The final results show PCs with 27 ridings, Liberals with 17, the Green Party with three, and the People's Alliance winning two seats. In all, 14 women have been elected, a record number for the province. Well, the U.S. is now backing away from tariffs it imposed on Canadian aluminum products. U.S. President Donald Trump had announced last month that he would bring back a 10 percent levy. But as Tom Perry reports, today Washington abruptly changed course. Right up to this morning, it looked like Canada was ready to strike back. I want to highlight that we will be taking action to counter the unjust tariffs uh, put on Canadian aluminum by the United States. Ottawa set to unveil retaliatory measures, a list of U.S. products that would face import duties. A response to measures announced this summer by U.S. President Donald Trump. Canada was taking advantage of us, as usual. But for all the president's bluster, the U.S. today backed down, cancelling a 10% levy on Canadian aluminum retroactive to September 1st. We all know that the last thing we need is tariffs. That's why it is such good news today that the United States has unilaterally chosen to lift its tariffs on Canadian aluminum exports. The federal government claiming victory. Canada has not conceded anything. We fully retain our right to impose our countermeasures if the U.S. administration decides to reimpose its tariffs on Canadian aluminum products, and we are prepared to do so. Canada has managed to push back this time, but Donald Trump has shown no hesitation about sparking trade wars. And Christia Freeland says with this administration, she's learned there are no guarantees. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. We had a, a period where, I mean, I didn't even know if we were gonna make it, to be honest, when he was away. Life as a rotational worker, this province knows that story well. A look back at that way of life, coming up next. Welcome back to Hearing Now. Well, tonight we've been touching on an age-old theme. Terry Roberts reported on the number of people returning to the province. Peter spoke with Trades NL, who says 80% of its workers are now unemployed. We dipped into the Hearing Now archives and found this report from when people were leaving for longer stretches of time and questioning whether their ties to home would be enough to keep them coming back. Here's that report from 2008. It's quite a phenomenon in Newfoundland, the number of people of all ages, fresh out of high school or near retirement, who spread out across the country, most particularly to Alberta, of course. 
every family has at least one of its number who is away at work. I saw a job when I was here this summer, similar job with the provincial government, and when you put it in perspective, everything in the you know the pension and the one that I personally have now pays between 70 and 80 percent more than the one in Newfoundland. So it's, it's that much. And so even when you take cost of living in, into account, it's still not apples to apples. You know? Over time, is, isn't it inevitable that you're going to kind of sink roots in the new place and that the, the call from here, from Newfoundland, is, go, is going, to get, going to get slimmer? That's, you know, that's tough. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's probably based on a lot of different things. Um, you know, what relations, relationships I developed in my new place and, and you know, and there's a, a, a practical reality. Is, is there something for me to come back for? Emails and frequent phone calls are the stuff of family ties these days. And of course, trips home for Christmas, holidays or birthdays. Every trip home is a reunion. You don't have an opportunity to miss them as much as yeah. I would think like my parents would have missed any yeah. of us if we had gone because communications is, are, are so much more advanced and so easy to get in contact with your children every single day at minimal cost that they're not, they're not as far away from you as they would have been had those communications not been in, available. This family started on traveling to work. Bernie, the father, actually left St. Pierre over 30 years ago to find work in Newfoundland and has been here just outside St. John's ever since. He knows the old truth, that where you work soon becomes where you live. Well, when you leave and you, you spend a certain amount of time in the, your new home, new place, uh, you develop uh, you know, a certain network, you, you make some friends and it becomes home, so sometimes like in my case, well, this is home, and uh, although a lot of Newfoundlands like to come back home, some have been gone for five years, 10 years, 20 years, we might never come back. And that's a reality, you know. The mass out-migration of Newfoundlanders may be a theme of the province's history, but it's the major social fact of the province today. It dates from the shutdown of the cod fishery and the mass impact on traditional livelihoods that resulted. It has emptied many of the outports, and not even the current boom in St. John's can absorb a fraction of the people who have been or are looking for work. Pam and Blair Gent are a fairly typical story of work and family life in modern Newfoundland. Both moved to Ontario 10 years ago, naturally, to find work. But their ties to Newfoundland, their feeling that home was a safer place for their kids, led them to come back. But there was still the question of work. There wasn't any, absolutely nothing. So, worked away a little while in the store and then uh, you know, I had to go away. There was just, just, you know, not enough to keep up on the bills. Blair headed for Fort McMurray. Blair's an all-rounder, a bricklayer, a stonemason, an instrumentation mechanic. Up at Fort Mac, where jobs are plenty, the hours long, the pay generous, almost everyone you meet is from Newfoundland. Oh, you run into people you know all your life and you run into people that know your father and people who know, some of you know, or there's just so many Newfoundlanders up there. It's just, you know. Are they from all over the island? Oh, yeah, everywhere, yeah, all over. So, you know, they like it, I'm sure, the work is there to, to be done, but everybody misses the home life. And the home life is number one, so. And once you make a good dollar, it's hard to break free, you know. And, and that, that pattern there used to be here, you know, I can remember it, uh, 20, 25 years ago, you'd shoot out of here, get eight or 10 weeks, and then come back, because really we're, we're going to work for the stamps. Is, is that going on still? That don't happen no more. Well, there's a few people that, that it works with, but uh, mostly everybody's up there. They don't go away for six or seven months anymore. They'll go for three or four years, you know, and that's just the but it, must, it must be hard on, on, on families. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had a, a period where, I mean, I didn't even know if we were going to make it, to be honest, when he was away. It was just really hard. I mean, our conversations were, they were angry, his cell phone bills were high. Yeah, I bet. Newfoundland is expecting something of a real boom in employment in the next few years. New labor, skilled and unskilled, will be needed to fuel that boom. But for all those who've gone outside already, those who have found ties and forged relationships at the new work sites outside the province, 
Will they come home? There's been a fundamental alteration in Newfoundland since the collapse of the fishery some 15 years ago. And it's a good question whether even the prosperous times around the corner have come too late to counter the effects of out-migration and too late to halt the transformation that's already underway. Rex Murphy, CBC News, St. John's. Wow, flashback there to 2008. Well, it was an ice cold spring for Canadian home sales because of COVID-19, but the market has certainly thawed since then. New real estate numbers out today show that in the late summer, housing sales in most of the country were red hot. But as Jacqueline Hansen reports, the data seems to defy logic. Last month was the busiest August for home sales ever. That's right, in the middle of a pandemic, Canadian real estate has already made a complete comeback. If you had asked anyone a few months ago during, when this pandemic first began, where they thought sales might be, I don't think anyone had sales activity back at record levels. But here we are. It's partly due to pent up demand. COVID-19 lockdown measures came into effect right in the middle of the typically busy spring season and home sales dried up almost entirely. April was the worst month on record in more than 30 years. But it's clear with the latest numbers from the Canadian Real Estate Association, that chill was just temporary. Sales were up by 33% compared to last year and average prices increased by nearly 20%. That's despite the fact that more than a million Canadians are still out of work and immigration levels have fallen sharply. The two traditional drivers of demand for housing, which is employment and population growth, are both very weak and yet we see demand at record levels. So it's, it's a bit counterintuitive. It's unclear to me that this can be sustained going forward. Rock bottom interest rates, federal financial aid and mortgage deferrals have likely added to the strength of the real estate market. How long the effects of all that will last is still very much unclear. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Ashley is back with your weather recap. So how are things shaping up tomorrow? Well, heading through the night tonight, you might wake up to some frost through parts uh, mainly all across the island, except for the northern peninsula. But after that, temperatures will rebound beautifully tomorrow afternoon. We're looking at plenty of sunshine, maybe some hazy skies low down along the southwest, and we can think the potential uh, for that smoke moving in again tomorrow. But uh, temperatures will be beautiful, somewhere between 15 to 17 degrees through the day. However, we are looking at showers moving in late day along the western portion of the island and we'll see the showers move from Lab West through to uh, coastal areas of Labrador as we head through the day tomorrow as well. Great. Thanks so much, Ashley. Well, here's something, Ashley, we'll be keeping an eye on for sure. Millions of Americans along the U.S. Gulf Coast are bracing for a dangerous Category 1 hurricane. Hurricane Sally is not to be taken for granted. We are looking at record flooding perhaps breaking historic levels. The slow moving storm Sally is expected to dump as much as 75 centimeters of rain over parts of Alabama and Florida during the next 24 hours. That's an average four months worth of rainfall in one day. The entire region from Florida to Louisiana could also see life threatening storm surge and 100 kilometers an hour winds. Sally is expected to make landfall late tonight or in the early hours of Wednesday morning. The Arctic is warming so quickly, it's moving into what experts say is an entirely different climate. New research is showing a transition from a mostly frozen state into one with significantly less sea ice, warmer weather, and even a rainy season. Greg Rasmussen has the details about the profound changes taking place in the planet's north. Drilling deep for answers. These researchers are measuring changes in the ice in Canada's north. Part of an overwhelming flood of data used in a new study that reveals a line is being crossed into uncharted territory. The Arctic climate is changing dramatically and rapidly 
and so much and so fast that it is transitioning to a new climate. A climate with more rain and less snow, where temperatures have trended up and show no signs of reversing. Ice covering the oceans is shrinking dramatically. That's a matter of one to two decades, a change that is so rapid that it's statistically putting it into a, a different regime. And that is, um, that's astonishing. That's astonishing. It certainly has uh, the potential to be incredibly impactful for people. The shrinking amount of ice has this climate scientist of Inuit descent worried. And we haven't done a great job in, in this country and many northern countries in preparing for climate change. And you could see that there's some snow out in the mountains. For people in the north, the stakes couldn't be higher, with worries about the impact on wildlife, communities, and people. And just knowing that these ice conditions are changing and are a lot more dangerous than they were before is kind of scary. And you're just worried the whole time that you have loved ones or friends out on the ice because you're worried for their safety. As if to underscore the report, in Greenland, a 110 square kilometer chunk has broken off the country's largest ice sheet. One more sign of climate trouble. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, from the Arctic to the desert, the Great Pyramids are not standing majestically alone, surrounded by wind-swept sand. Instead, they're surrounded on three sides by roads and urban sprawl. Now, construction has resumed on two eight-lane highways on the Pyramid Plateau. The proposal was made long ago, but suspended in the 90s after an international outcry. But it's been revived by Egypt's president, who's building a new capital city to ease population pressure on Cairo. One of the new superhighways will cross south of the pyramids. The second will pass between pyramids. Critics warn of damage to the last intact wonder of the ancient world. Wow. And that's about it for us tonight on Here and Now. Thanks so much for watching. It's going to be a busy day tomorrow. Yes, we have uh, the COVID briefing, of course. It's Wednesday. So that will be, uh, we'll, find, we'll find out what's going to be happening there. And of course, the House of Assembly is sitting as well. Yeah, and we're expecting a protest from uh, union workers concerned about oil and gas. So we'll be talking about all those stories on tomorrow night's show. So make sure you tune in. Yes, hope you can join us. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Good night.